Good morning, everyone. Uh, to the welcome to the Georgia Department of Public Health Strike and Support Team uh, office hours for assisted living facilities and personal care homes. Uh, today is our first office hours of the year um, for everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. And also today we have a, a guest presenter, Shirley Rodriguez, who is the program director uh, for the personal care home, pro home program with the Georgia Department of Community Health. Uh, Shirley is uh, Shirley Rodriguez is a registered nurse with many years of experience in healthcare regulations. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing and a master's degree in education and has worked for several years regulating state and federal programs in Kentucky and while with the Georgia Department of Community Health, HFRD. She has an extensive background in education and also has worked for several years as a, as a college lecturer as director of the personal care home program, she is committed to ensuring that both surveyors and providers are well informed of the regulations pertaining to the delivery of healthcare in a safe environment. And she devotes a significant amount of her time to surveyor and provider training. And so welcome, Shirley. We're so glad to have you here with us. Before we jump into the presentation, we want to say a special thank you to our partners, the Georgia Department of Public Health, and the University of Georgia for their collaboration and support for without them, um, we, will not be, we would not be able to bring you these office hours. Next slide, please. So during the presentation today, we'll provide information on assisted living facility and personal care home infection control regulations. Uh, we'll also show resources and information to support COVID-19 infection prevention and control activities. And then during this presentation, um, we will address any fac facility specific IPC questions or concerns you may have. So we encourage you to go ahead and drop those questions uh, in the chat or the Q and or in the Q&A section. But um, actually, I believe it's just a chat se section today. So if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to drop those in in the chat and uh, that's what we're here for today to support you and all of your initiatives and efforts and address any questions you may have. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shirley. Thank you so much, Erica, for that introduction. I just wanted to pop on video for a while to say hi to everybody and to say what a pleasure it is to be collaborating with the Department of Public Health and with the Lion to discuss infection control issues. Uh, as an agency, HFR, the Healthcare Facility Regulation Division, has always worked closely with the Department of Public Health on issues of infection control with the goal of ensuring a safe environment for all the clients served and with providing providers with enough information so that they could set up effective systems and best practices in their facilities. So I'll just go off video for now and share my presentation. So I have put together a presentation that deals with the regulations for assisted living communities and personal care homes. And there will be common trends among the facilities. There's hardly much difference between the two. But if we'll advance the slide forward, before getting into that, I just wanted to state the Department of Community Health's mission and that is to provide access to affordable quality health care in our communities. Also to be responsible for health planning and use of health care resources to promote healthy behaviors and improved health outcomes. As I said before, these regulations have to deal with assisted living communities and personal care homes. And the first set of regulations that I want to talk about have to do with training. We do require that initial training be done for all staff members before they actually work independently with residents in the personal care home environment and in the assisted living community environment. The regulation as it pertains to the assisted living community states that the administrator or the on-site manager must ensure that any person who works in an assisted living facility as staff receives within six months of employment training in general infection control principles. And this very basic introductory training has to do with the importance of hand washing and hand hygiene 
and attendance policies when ill. Okay, so this tag is 0802 as it relates to the assisted living facilities. And when you go on to the next slide, you will see that in the personal care homes, the situation is the same. The requirement is the same. The tag is different. It's 0909, but it has to do with the person in charge, the administrator or the executive director being responsible for ensuring that before any staff person would work independently with residents, they would have received training in infection control principles. With regard to the memory care units, they are memory care units that are at both facility types. The next slide deals with the requirement. Mm -hmm. the, previous, the previous slide stated that the new employee has 60 days at least within which to get into compliance. But in the memory care unit, this training is to be done from their one. So the only difference in, in the only difference is that the memory care unit requires that this training be done immediately, whereas in the general units in the personal care home section and the assisted living, the employee can work with another qualified staff person for 60 days and within that time get that training done. Okay, if we advance to the next slide, and that's the requirement as it relates to memory care unit. Our next tag relates to an infection control program. Each facility is supposed to have policies and procedures that address infection control, and that would deal with certain things that are required to promote a safe environment apart from the training the first slide has to do with assisted living facilities. The assisted living community must have an infection control program, which includes at the minimum training, and we've already discussed training to some extent. So it's training to be provided to staff on measures for minimizing the spread of infections and foodborne illnesses. And another very important component of that training is to detail how the facility would respond to disease outbreaks appropriately and participate in infection control investigations. And I want to emphasize part B particularly because most times, and hopefully it's not that often, but it has happened frequently, uh, facilities reach out to us because there may be an outbreak of, let's say, okay, Le Legionnaire's disease is a big one. And when the facility does that, we would reach out to our sister agency, the Department of Public Health, or it could be the other way. The Department of Public Health reaches out to us and we work in tandem together to ensure that that facility puts in place certain measures to ensure the protection of staff and residents and to contain whatever outbreak exists. During this process, the Department of Public Health or Healthcare Facility Regulation would reach out to the facility requesting documentation, requesting certain uh, procedures be put in place. And when that happens, when we reach out, whether it's on site or whether we go, uh, whether we reach out but via email, it is very important. The onus is on the facility to cooperate with these investigations and to do so in a prompt manner. So as part of your policy, the facility should already identify someone who would take the lead. And most likely that would be the administrator or the executive director, because that's the person that we hold responsible for providing general oversight to the community. So in situations like these, when we're in the middle of an investigation or we're trying to determine what's happening so that we can support you through whatever crisis you may have at that time, to contain it and to employ the use of best practices, it is very urgent that 
you respond promptly to phone calls, you respond promptly to requests for documents, and we work together collaboratively to quell whatever is going on and ensure that everyone is kept safe. So I just wanted to expand a little bit more on the response to disease outbreaks because that is so critical to ensure smooth functioning. Okay, if we could go on to the next slide, this also has to do with the responsibilities of the facilities. The infection control program also must <clears throat> Include staffs demonstrating their understanding and use of proper infection control practices in the delivery of care to the residents. So not only does this include training the staff, but the facility should have a QA, some QA measures in place where they actually observe the delivery of care and observe that staff is demonstrating that they understand the basic principles of standard precautions. The next item, enforcing work and return to work policies to minimize the spread of infection and illnesses. And that would be the facility's internal policy. Of course, this would be dependent on whatever documentation the employee has from their position to ensure that they are ready to be returned to their position without presenting a threat to staff or residents. And facilities are required also to implement additional infection control requirements as set forth in the rules and regulations for a disaster preparedness plan, chapter 111816, regarding pandemic plans, supplies, and policies and procedures. This particular item has to do with some additional regulations that the department put in place following the outbreak of the pandemic. And the next slide discusses those items that are required the facility is supposed to have an effective infection control program, which includes at least the following. And again, training is emphasized on measures of minimizing the spread of infection. There must also be a system of responding promptly to disease outbreaks, a system of monitoring staff to ensure the delivery of care in a safe environment. We did talk about the return to work policies, but I want to pay particular attention to the item, the last item on that list, providing notices as recommended by public health regarding outbreaks and infestation issues to residents, staff and visitors. So homes licensed for 20, 25 or more beds must meet the notification requirements of the rules and regulations for disaster preparedness plans. Okay, so we know that for assisted living facilities, there are 25 or more beds. So they would automatically have to implement these regulations that are referenced here in item F. For personal care homes, they are mom and pop homes with two beds, two to 24 beds, and they're homes with 25 and more beds. These regulations would pertain to the homes that have 25 or more beds. For the smaller homes, we consider that they're more a group home community and the specific infection control requirements that are contained in the rules and regulations for personal care homes would apply because they are not dealing with a big community. So for homes 25, beds and more, the disaster preparedness plan, chapter 111816, spells out some additional items that need to be incorporated in your facility policies. And if we would just go on to the next slide, this is some basic general information that the homes should have an adequate supply of these products, and this applies to all homes. Okay, 
So for the homes, the bigger facilities, the homes with 25 or more beds, there's some special requirements. One of these is that those homes are required to maintain a minimum of a seven day supply of protective masks, surgical gowns, eye protection and gloves, sufficient to protect all residents and staff. And this would be based on the CDC guidelines and with consideration given to any widespread supply shortages documented by the facility or known to the department. I know that in the first few days of the pandemic, supplies, getting supplies, the facilities and acquire, acquiring your own supplies was a distinct problem. And so facilities are urged to maintain this seven day supply as a cushion so that in the event you have the need, these supplies are ready to be available for your staff and to continue to provide care. So when we go into homes that are 25 or more beds, we do, look, we do check to ensure that you have an adequate supply of protective equipment to continue to provide care. The other requirement is that the facility must maintain and publish for the residents and representatives their policies and procedures pertaining to infection control and mitigation within the facilities and update such policies and procedures annually. So this has a lot to do with information sharing with regard to your policies that are put in place to prevent and mitigate the spread of infection within the facilities. I would say also that a very big part of a very big part of this communication has to do with visitation. And visitation had always been a hot button issue. It was during the pandemic and at some point it still is an issue because there are many, many phone calls that I would receive on a regular basis with regards to visitation. A facility has the right to assess its environment and determine what's safe for everyone, for staff and for residents. In doing so, it is very important that you communicate to family members who may not exactly know what's happening and who may come to the facility and see a post-it sign. And, and that's when we get the call. I'm being refused visitation. I can't visit with my family member. We try as much as possible to allow the facility, we do allow the facility to utilize its policy whenever I get a call from a family member that has to do with visitation, I would reach out to the facility or have a member of my team do so, requesting the facility's visitation policies. So if you're having an outbreak of any kind that is temporary, you must update your policies and your communication to family members. If the communication is open and clear, it prevents a lot of issues. So I just wanted to make that particular point in relation to communicating policies and procedures to residents and their representatives. Now there is no need to disclose health information, but you can absolutely say that the facility is currently in the process of enforcing some policies to ensure the protection of everyone. This is temporary at this time. This is what we will do to accommodate your request to be in touch with your family member. Oh, and I think that brings us to the conclusion of uh, what I had prepared for you in terms of infection control and the requirements that we have with regard to personal care homes and assisted living facilities. Again, I just want to recap that they are mom and pop homes, which are run in a family environment, just like you would your own home, and where your infection control procedures would 
be basically concentrated on hand hygiene, hand washing, making sure that you have disinfecting agents, making sure that you have adequate supplies for hand washing and hand hygiene. In terms of the bigger facilities, 25 or more beds, which would include all of the assisted living facilities, and which would include personal care homes with 25 or more beds, because there is such a great risk for community spread, they are additional requirements. And those requirements have to do with ensuring that you have an adequate amount of supplies in place in the event that you are containing an outbreak. And for all facility types, whether you're a mom and pop facility type or a big facility, if ever you have an outbreak, if ever you have anything that you think is getting a bit much to handle, please reach out to us. We have resources that we can employ in terms of education, in terms of, uh, in terms of making on-site visits and additional recommendations. So please, it's far better to reach out to us so that we can join forces and contain whatever it is that you have going on rather than sit on it and wait for it to be a real problem. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I will be happy to entertain those. Thank you so much, Shirley. This was such an informative presentation. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat in the moment, but I would in, encourage everyone um, who's uh, here with us today, if you have any questions or concerns, just feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll address them. Um, as we're you know, waiting for that, if anyone does have any questions, I actually have a few questions and comments that I would like to share, Shirley. Um, sure. One is foremost that like again your presentation was was spot on and um you know really really important in, in recognizing um you know how your policy should also match your practice or vice versa how your practice should match your policy uh, policy and um it, as you mentioned it's very very important for um administrators to observe your facility practices especially those related to infection prevention and control so making sure that they're observing them potentially auditing them making sure that everything is done correctly and appropriately so i really appreciate the emphasis on that um and you know as it relates to um some of the the issues that um, have come up and some that you mentioned, especially like visitation, which is a hot button topic. Um, it's, it's very important, again, for us to communicate what our policy is, what our IPC practice is, and also that expectation with the, with the food visitors as well. Um, in addition to the visitation issue, have you noticed any other challenges as you've um, been working with uh, personal care homes or assistant living facilities? Are there any op other opportunities that you see that are becoming more of an issue or that have been more of an issue, but maybe have um, gotten better due to probably some improvement activities that you've noticed? Off the top of my head, um, I know that, and I, and the that's why I'm, I'm very glad that we're collaborating like this on this training exercise. I know that a, a very many questions come into us on training and training opportunities because facilities want to, to do good and they want to ensure that they head off any potential problems. And we're, while uh, we don't provide that much on training in terms of infection control, we have for the most part been directing facilities to the CDC website as well as DPH's website. So I know that that is a particular issue that comes up from time to time, information on infection control and what kind of training can be provided to the staff. We do require initial training, like I discussed um, when we were doing the PowerPoint for new employees. And then there is the need for ongoing training as well. So they do have an annual requirement for uh, updated training on infection control. So that, that is one uh, area that I think that um, comes up from time to time. Erica and Shirley, thank you for that explanation, Shirley, but we do have a question in chat. 
Regarding the requirement to publish policies to residents and responsible parties, is communication via email with new cases and changes in practices as a result of those incidents sufficient or does the actual policy need to be shared? Okay, uh, email communication should be fine. Email communication to responsible parties should be fine. Now, if let's say that your visiting hours are impacted because of a situation that you have going on, a general email blast should be sufficient. We would expect also that you would have direct communication by phone or some other method with the resident's family member, the resident that's involved in whatever case it is, that there will be more than just a, an email notification, that there will be some discussion as to what is going on as it relates to the resident's health and as it relates to the outbreak. And you will also share the measures that you are taking to mitigate the spread. Thank you, Shirley. And then we have another question. Are the COVID screenings still required each shift for all residents? Okay, let me uh, repeat that to be sure I understand this. All right. Are the COVID screenings still required each shift for all residents? Okay, I don't know that we have a requirement or a regulation that asks for COVID screenings each shift. What we, hmm, I'm wondering, is this to do with testing, lab testing or vaccinations? Could, for the person that entered that need, question, could you be a little more uh, specific in what you're asking, please? These always to current guidance on the CDC website, as well as Department of Public Health. Temperature when we were, and symptoms. When we were in the middle of the pandemic, we know we all had screenings of visitors. You know, you would go into a facility and you'd have to do all these questions. Have you traveled outside of the country? And all of that has gone away, even in doctor's offices. So and Shirley? Has, I'm sorry. Shirley, I'm sorry. They have been more descript. Uh, okay. So... Let me reread this. Are the COVID screenings still required each shift for all residents to include temperatures and symptoms? And is this a personal care home or is this the living facility? Because we do not have such screenings in the regulations. We do not. We do not have such screenings in the regulations. Now, if you have a resident who is showing symptoms, you would, of course, have the resident and seek medical attention or whatever guidance you get from the physician is sufficient to employ. But there has never been a time when we have required every shift screening for residents. I could actually jump in here to help answer some of those questions. Uh, Shirley, uh, thank you so much uh, to the person that posed that question. And uh, as Shirley mentioned, um, the, the um, requirements about implementing IPC, uh, certain, certain IPC interventions vary uh, from long-term care facility to compared to assisted living facilities um, or personal care homes. What is recommended, and I shared the link here, is that um, the facility implement IPC practices based on their discretion, but also based on the community level transmission. So. Um, if we, if you look at the link that I, sh I shared in the chat, so that if you go to cdc.gov, you can see um, some of the, uh, like the COVID, le the level of COVID transmission in your, in your area. And based on that, um, if, if there is, a, based on that tiered indication, so it's low, medium, high, and high, 
there are certain recommendations that you should be doing based on that. So for example, if you have um, a, a medium or high amount of COVID-19 in your facility, or excuse me, in your community, it might be uh, best for you to go ahead and implement that, that screening potentially as you're, as you're thinking about uh, COVID maybe coming into your facilities. Um, but at all levels of um, just, you know, intervention and strategies, but specifically at all levels of potential transmission, so low, medium, and high, we should all be promoting uh, equitable access to the vaccination, uh, testing, the, the uh, accessibility of, of masks and respirators, those resources to help prevent infections, treatment um, as, as, as well, and any type of additional uh, testing that may be needed, especially if you're picking up um, a, you know, positive case, because then um, you might actually subsequently potentially develop an outbreak in your facility if you um, are not following up on uh, residents with symptoms or even um, who eventually uh, have a positive test. So um, I am going to put a link in the chat that actually covers um, the question in much detail. Uh, we presented uh, the, the context of what you all should be doing um, with IPC um, in your facilities based on the updated recommendations back in November of last year. And all of those resources and information that will help answer this question and many more, I will drop that link in the chat to those slides and also the link to that webinar. So I think that was a very great question and still pertinent and relevant today, um, considering that we also not just have COVID circulating, but also other respiratory viruses like influenza and some of those same strategies, um, just monitoring for any type of respiratory illness or infection among your residents or visitors still could be helpful in preventing outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Erica. And we have another question. Regarding notification of families, is there an expected time frame that the notification should occur? That would be within 24 hours. And another question, should we be screening our staff members as they come in each shift? Again, I think this speaks to what Erica was talking about previously. If you report to us that you have an outbreak of COVID, let's say, we will ask you whether you have reported this to the Department of Public Health, because uh, we, the Public Health Department is the, our leader in this, so to speak. And it, we work closely together, but we allow public health to work with the facility, making recommendations depending on whether you're at the medium level, high level, just like Erica explained. Okay, so for us from HFR, our guidance would be work closely with the Department of Public Health to see what mitigation strategies you need to put in place for your department to ensure the safety of everyone. Thank you so much. And at this time, we don't have any further questions. However, you have been given the opportunity today to have several, several websites or links to our website, as well as previous presentations. And then uh, just a few minutes ago, the November slide deck and information that Erica referenced has those, that link has also been dropped in the chat. So at this time, we do not have any more questions. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. And again, thank you, Shirley, for um, for joining us today. And thank you for everyone taking your time out of your busy schedule to, to join us for this wonderful information and comprehensive information, as well as uh, for those who are asked questions. Um, again, we are available to support you. And here we have our, our contacts here, the Georgia Department of Public Health, the Healthcare Associated Infections Team contacts. So please feel free if you have additional questions or concerns, or even as Shirley mentioned, if you need to reach out to the Department of Public Health, if you have any questions or concerns about your practices and even potential cases um, of COVID, just reach out to um, your contacts on the screen here. Next slide, please. We encourage you to save the date for our next um, office hour session. So on Friday, February 17th at 11 a.m., we have a session specifically for skilled nursing facilities and medical directors. And then again, on Friday, February 24th at 11 a.m., we have a session for assisted living facilities and personal care homes. And actually, um, to circle back, 
uh, to Shirley's uh, content in her presentation. Um, and these next few sessions will actually talk about the importance of observing and auditing your IPC practices. So it fits right in line um, with the, uh, the information that we've shared today. And we're going to uh, provide more information about how you can do that effectively and efficiently and also support your training initiatives um, and resources. So please join us for our next sessions in February. Next slide, please. A special thanks again to the Georgia Department of Public Health and the University of Georgia and for their ongoing collaboration. Um, next slide. And we encourage you all to continue to join us and reach out to us and follow us on our social media handles listed here. And again, if you have any questions or concerns, um, we're here to support your IPC needs. So thank you so much for all the things that you do on a daily basis to keep your residents and staff safe. And we look forward to you joining us in February for our next session. Have a great afternoon or great morning and afternoon. Thank you.